Welcome to Muriel's Murders. I'm Muriel, and I love true crime. I'm Nick, and I'm not a fan. Thank you for joining us. Each week, I force Nick to listen to me tell him a story of a true crime. This week, we talk about a murderous cross-country rampage. Damn. So, <laughs> are you ready for this one, Nikki? I don't know. This sounds very violent. There's some violence in this okay. one. Okay. Well, I will just steal myself. I will rise to your level of psychopathic, uh, true crime, cold-bloodedness, and I am prepared to make this happen. <laughs> well, that's good. You have a great attitude today. <laughs> I always have a good attitude. <laughs> You'd quit trying to poison the people against me. Uh, but speaking of the people, yes. we have to give a huge shout out to our newest Patreon member, Dobie Wan Glass. Thank yes. you so much for signing up. It's the number one way to support Muriel's Murders, and it means the world to us. The more the merrier, baby. And I just want to give a quick reminder, everyone, this is a true story involving murder, violence, drugs, adult themes, etc. So... If any listeners are like Nick and they don't want to hear about those kinds of things, please consider listening to a different podcast. And in addition to that, Muriel and I ourselves will probably curse a little bit, so please consider yourself warned. That's right. Hell. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> All right, Nikki. Are you ready to hear this story? No. Okay, let's get started. I'm really not sure what I'm more scared of, the murderous rampage of the story you're going to tell or the murderous rampage of the storyteller, a.k.a. you, onslaughting me with whatever I'm about to hear. <laughs> uh, what? All right. <laughs> let's get started. Right, let's do it. <laughs> okay. So on January 16th, 1977. William Rhett Zambito was stopped for speeding in Stewart, Florida. And in his car, he had two and a half pounds of cocaine. Damn. 110 pounds of weed, 1,200 Valium tablets, a sawed-off shotgun, and there were two quarts of dried human blood in his trunk. I am in. What? <laughs> That's a good opener, Muriel. That's a good one. Okay, I am hooked. 1977, two and a half pounds of cocaine. And 110 pounds of weed. Uh, pretty crazy, right? That is a lot. Okay, Florida, late 70s. This story is on and cracking. Okay, great. I'm all ears. So he tells the officer that all of the drugs that he has in his car yeah. belong to this Miami Playboy guy named John Piazza. Okay. So Zambito worked with this giant redheaded monster dude named Alan Benton. Okay. And they sold drugs in kind of the southeastern quadrant of the country uh -huh. for Piazza. Okay. So in the face of, you know, possessing all of these pounds and pounds of drugs. It sounds like his car was literally completely stuffed with drugs it had to have been <laughs> yeah, right? right and i'm always always like why are you speeding <laughs> yeah. i would just don't do that <laughs> okay and the human blood but all right so he's, the whole thing is crazy yeah. so you know faced with the fact that he's caught with pounds and pounds of drugs yeah zambito decides to flip on piazza and benton okay in exchange for a more lenient sentence all right ultimately he goes to trial he testifies against John Piazza and Alan Benton. Mm -hmm. And he ends up actually putting 11 people behind bars on narcotics charges. Damn. Right? So he was kind of very much a linchpin in that situation. Yeah. A very important rat. Very important rat. So Zambito is super adamant that he does not want to enter the witness protection program, which was kind of in its infancy at this at this time. Okay. So he was sent to serve seven years at a U.S. penitentiary in the Southwest. 
So, you know, his crimes were all happening around Florida and the Southeast. Yeah. And so the penitentiaries out there Mm -hmm. are packed with people that want to murder him. Right. Right. (laughs) Like they want to kill the snitch. Yeah. He's like, I don't want to don't put me in witness protection, but can you at least put me in part of the country where no one knows who I am? Right. That's kind of the way that he that that's how he solved that for himself. (laughs) So (laughs) so on his way to the Southwest. He has to have this brief stop over at the state penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia, Uh-oh. just to, uh, like in transport. Right. Uh-oh. And the Atlanta penitentiary was a pretty scary place for Zambito to be held for a couple of reasons. One, his former partner, mm-hmm. big redheaded boy, yeah. Alan Benton, who Zambito had ratted out, yeah. was also at the Atlanta State Penitentiary serving right. his sentence. And sorry, I have a clarifying question. They were sort of like the muscles of the operation and were like moving the drugs for Piazza. Yes. It's too complicated to go totally into, yeah. but there was just a huge sort of ladder. Uh-huh. And it was all kind of connected to organized crime and yeah. biker gangs and like all kinds of I stuff. I was going to ask, these are Italian names. And as a person with one of those names, I'm piquing my little Spidey Sense interests. Well, are Alan, they mobbed up? They're mobbed up in some regards. Uh-huh. It's actually... They're so mobbed up yeah. that it's like impossible <laughs> to tell what the hell is going on. <laughs> right, like I yeah. read so many court transcripts yeah. and you're just like, how these guys like they're so <laughs> it's so incestuous, you know, yeah, uh-huh. that like they all just know each other. I mean, there's lots of like overlap, you know, mm-hmm. people are involved in double, triple crimes. And then (laughs) that guy is like, oh, I thought he was from that case. Oh, no, he's in all the cases. (laughs) And then at one point, John Piazza, I think, went into the witness protection program. Uh And so it was like hard to track him. Sure. And then he would be quoted as saying something, but Mm -hmm. then they can't attribute it to him. You know, so it's hard to follow. But yes, everybody's mobbed up in that situation. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so the number one reason it's dangerous to be in Atlanta is because this other redheaded killer i'm guessing he's a killer i just said that i don't know if he's a killer uh is locked up there right alan benton is locked up and he's pissed all right yeah (laughs) so the second reason why this is a scary prison to be in at this time is because the fbi was actually there investigating the prison due to a big murder problem (laughs) all right so (laughs) around this time and in this time period of about 17 months around this time nine inmates had been murdered including two major figures in the famous french connection case so i don't know if you know a lot about the french connection no i don't know there's a movie yeah right i remember the movie but i don't remember the specifics very much the french connection was the name for a heroin smuggling ring that started in the 1930s there was a circuitous route basically from asia into europe and then through france that then smuggled heroin into the u.s and canada yeah and they were responsible for 80% of the right. heroin coming into the U.S. by yeah. 1969. Um, uh, and those guys are getting murdered directly in this time period. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we're not going to go super deep into it. Yeah. But when things started falling apart for the people involved in the French Connection, yeah. some were sent to the state pen in Atlanta. Yeah. And in the 1970s, they were being murdered. Okay, great. <laughs> so there was a lot of, like, murdering going on. And some of it is really connected to super high profile cases. Yeah, drug cases. Right, exactly. All right. So on March 22nd, 1978, Zambito was placed in an unlocked cell with two other inmates. So they didn't lock the cells so people had, I mean, that seems horrifying to me. Right. But I guess they didn't lock the cells so people during times of the day uh-huh. could access the whole prison, like the whole prison. Yeah, I've not been to prison, but I've seen enough TV shows involving prison where people can kind of come and go and the cells aren't always locked. Right, right, okay. right, right. So the next morning, Zambito was found stabbed to death in his bed. Damn. A one-eyed bank robber named Marion Albert Pruitt, who was a cellmate of Zambito's, told prison officials he saw Alan Benton sneak into their cell, sneak over to Zambito's bed and stab him to death. So there's a murder trial and Marion Pruitt testifies against Benton uh-huh. in the murder trial. Hold on, time out. Did you just sneak in that he's a one-eyed bank robber? Yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll keep going with that. <laughs> <laughs> he is the one-eyed bank robber. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> so just he, sneaking that in there. Okay, I see you. So 
Pruitt testifies against Benton. Yeah. Right. And even during the trial, too, he he talks a lot about how jittery Zambito was like the day before. He knew something was up. He yeah, was, right. He's in the one place he didn't want to be. Right. And Pruitt says Zambito was asking him all kinds of questions about the hole. All right. You know, so he, he really knew Zambito was hiding from someone. What's the hole? What do you the hole is like, like isolation, uh-huh. right? So Zambito got to the Atlanta State Prison yeah. and he was like, really knew he was in hot water. Sure. And he wanted to go into the hole. He had kind of been talking about doing that because uh-huh. it's just kind of the type of thing that saves you, puts you in isolation. Yeah, so right. Reach He's you, like, I'm right? here for one day. Just say, just keep me in the closet. Right. But the problem is, is that if other inmates see him go to the hole without mm-hmm. him doing anything to get into the hole, yeah. then they know that he asked to be in the hole. Damn. And then you have a whole nother network of people being like, that guy's a snitch. Muriel, your prison yard politics lesson is really interesting. It's pretty, it was pretty, I mean, it's intense. I don't want to go to prison. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. please no. (laughs) Right, so, you know, at the trial, he talks about how, you know, Pruitt talks about how Zambito obviously had something going on. And then when he saw Benton stabbing him, he knew immediately, you know, it made sense to him on some level. So Benton is sentenced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. And Marion Pruitt was released early from his bank robbery sentence and entered into the now eight-year-old witness protection program. Oh, okay. So he's being protected from any retribution for snitching on Benton. We got a lot of levels of snitching going on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And just a quick side note about the witness protection program. It's a super fascinating thing. I don't know if you knew this, but it was actually founded to deal with preserving witnesses in organized crime like specifically i didn't Mm -hmm. know that yeah i I don't think i knew that but that makes sense yeah right so it was in its infancy you know in 1970 and so by this time things had been going but they're still developing it you Mm -hmm. know and and it's still sort of a new program (laughs) yeah they don't have the kinks ironed out yet right (laughs) they're like still calling them by by their name or something (laughs) whoops (laughs) yeah but Basically, like the recidivism rate, that's people who commit crimes again, yeah. was really low. It was about less than 17% of the people who were in the witness protection program at that time had uh-huh. reoffended, which is pretty good. So it was going well, uh-huh. just so we have an idea of what that looks like, too. Mm-hmm. You don't like get a bunch of money and get to like go live somewhere awesome. Like yeah. <laughs> they literally sit you down and they say, you know, where have you always wanted to live? Yeah. Give me five places you always wanted to live. And you list those off and you will never be placed in those places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, specifically? They're yeah. like, great. We're actually taking you to the this most terrible part of Wisconsin or I just mean, something that would never occur to you to move to. Yeah, well, because you're telling people that. If you tell the FBI, oh. these are my f- top five places that I'd like to live, right. you've definitely told someone at some point, these are the top five places I'd like to live. Oh, that's hilarious. I could just imagine like all the mafia bosses just like keeping mental note of where each person would live if they could choose anywhere to go. I mean, because they're just sitting, we've all seen The Sopranos, right? <laughs> they're just sitting around going like, if I grab the money, I just live in Hawaii. They're yeah. like, you're not going to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, right. um, uh, just I could imagine myself with a Negroni in Palm Springs. Not going to Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. They basically, they do try Try to match your standard of living. Mm-hmm. So if you've lived in a big city forever, mm-hmm. you know, they're not really going to put you in a tiny town. <laughs> Where you just stand out immediately. Right. <laughs> it's like you have to match the person with the thing. You yeah, know, yeah, right. they're going to find a- another metropolitan area where you'd fit in. So they do try to match sort of style of living with the thing. But the other thing that I think is kind of... Uh, a bummer that I think people might not know yeah. when they sign up is that they also match your socioeconomic status. So if you're like rich and living in New Jersey yeah. and you have to go to witness protection, they're going to try to set you up with a life that is comparable. Why? Just because of the same reason, like if you're a big city kid, yeah. they don't want to put you in the middle of nowhere in a small town. Cause you're going to stand out. If you're, if you've been rich yeah. for 20 years and then they try to like, hook you up with like a sewage treatment plant job or something. <laughs> yeah, you know what right. I mean? Like you're going to stand out. You're you like, have to- I can't eat canned chili. <laughs> I'm used to venison. What is this garbage? Just like throwing fits at the supermarket. Yeah, it's very, I mean, but it makes sense, right? Yeah. So I mean, but it's I heartbreaking. Think, it's like the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. Well, that's the thing. It's yeah. like if you weren't 
super rich before you went in, yeah. then you're not going to, the life that you're being matched to is yeah. not going to be glamorous, right. right? And you may not have that idea. So with all that information in mind, yeah. our story now begins with a 30-year-old one-eyed bank robber <laughs> in witness protection. This might be the best episode yet, Muriel. <laughs> Quit having me. coming with this one. <laughs> Quit having me. <laughs> okay. okay, so Pruitt was born October 4th, 1949 in Gastonia, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. He was about five foot seven, mm -hmm. 165 pounds, not a huge guy. Right. And he has this like big mop of 70s curly brown hair. I'm picturing me, but at my ideal weight. <laughs> <laughs> He's like you, but kind of more sandy brown hair. A okay. little less, think less Mediterranean, more like, I don't know. American German. whitey. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I couldn't find anything about his early life. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one New York news, I don't know, some sort of trashy newspaper article <laughs> that said that he saved a school bus one time as a child before he started getting into legal trouble. But All right. the only, I, I don't think that's true. The only thing I could really find out is that I think he lost his eye because he fell down the stairs holding a Coke bottle. Oh, God. <laughs> so I think that as a kid. Oh, that is so bad. That To me, that's like worse than like losing it in a knife fight after a bank robbery right. or something. It, I mean, it's very gruesome. But that's the only thing I could find oh, out. Oh, that hurt my head. But regardless of that, <laughs> Marion Albert Pruitt yeah. was now Charles Sonny Pearson. Oh, okay. This is his witness protection identity. Right. So Charles Sonny Pearson is now released to Albuquerque to live with his wife, Pamela Sue Carnudson, who is now Michelle Pearson. Okay. Right? So on November 15th, 1979, the Pearsons <laughs> arrived in New Mexico, and they were paid a monthly allowance for nine months until Pruitt got a job driving a dump truck, and they secured a rental trailer. Uh, and then they were then terminated from the witness protection program. So once they're like embedded, then uh -huh. they're then all of the government support stops. So that's what I was saying about yeah. like you're matched like with like. Yeah. So he's like telling his wife, we're going to go in the witness protection yeah. program. We're going to get out there and really, you know, have a brand new life. But then the life they match up is like they're living in a <laughs> rental trailer in rural Albuquerque and he's driving a dump truck. So. That would make such an interesting social experiment to have the witness protection program tell you like where they would relocate you and what your new identity would be because it would be just them telling you how they define you yeah, or whatever. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Like that would be an interesting reality show. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'd go into witness protection program and like play, like be a poker card shark or something like mm, actually you're a garbage man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know there's nothing wrong with being a garbage no, man but of i think not. that of course what, not. i think what's funny is that these guys are coming from a position where it's maybe a little glamorous like you're a drug runner in yeah, florida right. so on paper it feels like you have this big life exactly right uh, but then you get placed and it's a, such a quiet life because now you can't do any of the fun illegal stuff. Also, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, <laughs> and there were definitely rumors that he was doing bad things. Oh, of course. Yeah. Sure. I mean, definitely doing drugs, definitely uh -huh. getting in with whatever criminal element was in Albuquerque. Uh -huh. Like that's not something you could stay away from. Right. There's not a lot of information about that, but it definitely is in the ether of what's happening. Right. So in April of 1981, Charles Sonny Pearson walked into the Albuquerque police station and said he thought the unidentified burnt corpse recently found in the desert by two gas workers was the body of his wife, Michelle. Oh. And he says, I'm a protected government witness, and so was she, and maybe someone got to her. Mm, suspicious. So Pearson had reported her missing six weeks earlier on March 2nd. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he told police that they had gotten into this argument and Michelle had gotten super pissed at him mm -hmm. and stormed out of their trailer at like two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so he says, the last time I saw her was two o'clock in the morning and she was walking down the train tracks to get into town. So Charles Pearson views the body. He identifies her as Michelle. And the body had been beaten really badly oh. with a blunt object and strangled. 
and then somebody had doused it in gasoline and lit the body on fire and left it in a desert. Oh, Jesus. And while Charles Pearson is viewing the body, he doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't really show any emotions. And the sheriff is super, super suspicious. Yeah. Right? It sounds like it. Well, because also it's like, how? why did he think that that might be her to begin with when he showed up and said, oh, you know that body that I heard about in the well, news? Well, because he's like, oh, she's been gone for six weeks. I haven't heard from her. Mm-hmm. And I bet you that's her. Mm. I mean, it does seem pretty convenient. <laughs> right? And I mean, then th- th- this body sounds completely unrecognizable the way you're describing it. So he's like, oh, that's definitely her. It's like, how could he tell? Uh, I She might have had a medical ID bracelet. I did read about that. Uh-huh. But he definitely did. He identified the remains positively. Right. Um. So Sheriff Gennaro Ferreira is, you know, obviously he's suspicious, like I said. Mm-hmm. And and he's trying to figure out who this guy is. He's like, okay, this guy, Pearson, yeah. shows up and he says he's in the witness protection program. So what's your identity? Mm-hmm. And Pearson's like, oh, I'm not going to tell you that. He's, you know, you need to tell me. I need to figure out what's going on. He won't do it. So yeah. he calls up the witness protection program agent, Ruben Chavez. Mm-hmm. And Chavez says, based on the program's rules, I can't give you any information about the identity of this guy. So... He did say, however, that Michelle called him on March 1st, the day before she disappeared, saying she was afraid of her husband and thought he was trying to kill her. Oh. So Michelle had planned to escape the following morning. Yeah. And then a few hours later, after Michelle's call, Pearson called Chavez to tell him that Michelle had run off. (sighs) Okay. All right. I'm putting these, putting this together. Sounds like he murdered his wife. So... Ferreira had Pearson for three days, the legal max he could hold him without any evidence. Mm-hmm. So he took Pearson's fingerprints and he sends them to the FBI for a background check. And the response takes too long and he has to release Pearson legally. And after a while, he gets the background check back from the FBI. And the FBI says there's no criminal records associated with uh, Charles Pearson's fingerprints. And at this point... Charles Pearson flees the city. So he just disappears. He's gone. Yeah. Oh, God. So things go on in Albuquerque, the way things go on. And about a month later, a friend of Charles Pearson was arrested. And he offers to tell the sheriff what he knows about Michelle's death in return for a plea bargain. (laughs) All these guys are rats. I guess guess that's... What they say about the drug, you know, the drug trade is that especially if people are doing drugs and dealing drugs, they're going to snitch on you immediately. That's why Tony, you know, has to kill Christopher in The Sopranos. Well, and I think there's something about this new culture of witness protection, this new like era of cooperation between the federal government and people like this is still such a new thing. Yeah, everyone's you know, excited. They're like, yeah, get in the drug yeah, trade. You just snitch. They make you move to Albuquerque. It's fine. And now everybody's like, I'll just strike a bargain. You know, <laughs> yeah, like right. it's because yeah, yeah. I think it, it feels a little bit more fresh and new mm-hmm. and something that everybody's doing. Also, side note, sounds like this sheriff in Albuquerque, also an Italian. Uh, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. The name sort of sounded italian to me. Maybe you're right. Gennaro Ferreira. I think it's a great name. Yeah. So we're back to the snitching. Mm-hmm. The friend tells Ferrara that he had actually been visiting the Pearsons that night, the mm-hmm. night of March 1st, mm-hmm. when Michelle disappeared. And he says, after their big argument on the night of March 1st, Michelle didn't take off and walk down the train tracks. Michelle turned around and went to bed. All right. And then... Pearson beat her to death with a claw hammer and strangled her with a belt. So this guy witnessed the entire murder. Oh, my! look. I just feel like my skin just melted. A claw hammer? I don't even know what that is. And it just sounds it's just like, like a the normal worst hammer. thing in the whole world. It's, it's, it's like just a, the other side of the hammer. Yeah, it's that like, no, it's, that's what it's of. called. It's just a hammer. Oh, it's just a hammer. <laughs> that's still horrible. Oh my god! Yeah, no, uh, it's pretty awful. Uh, and and you know, this guy witnessed the whole thing and just didn't say anything. Right, and it was like, well, that, that was like, crazy. Well, I'll just commit a bunch of crimes, and uh, if I get caught, then I'll tell people about See it. See you later. So Ferreira immediately sends out a murder warrant for Charles Pearson, mm-hmm. but 
He has to get in line because he wasn't the only one trying to find Pearson. In the time that Pearson had been missing, he had gone on an interstate crime spree. So Pearson, who is now fully Marion Albert Pruitt again. In, in action. And he's, he's just, there's no, nobody cares about the witness protection <laughs> The one-eyed bitch is back, baby. Yeah. <laughs> he had driven all over the country. He was robbing banks in Seattle, Washington, in Corpus Christi, Texas, and in Tallahassee, Florida. Damn. And then in September of that year, yeah. so he's been robbing banks for months at yeah. this point, just driving all over the country. I mean, yeah. you think about it. He went from Albuquerque to I Seattle know. to Texas. <laughs> and then back to Tallahassee, you yeah. said, where he, people want to kill him probably for snitching on uh, Benton. Well, he's obviously on one, so yeah. I don't think he really cares. <laughs> he doesn't give a damn. So in September, Pruitt robbed a bank in Jackson, Mississippi, yeah. and he decided to take 42-year-old mother of two, Peggy Lowe, hostage. And he takes her to the Alabama state line, shoots her in the head, and dumps her body by the side of the road. So he's just like, um, and they cannot catch him. They can't yeah. catch him. They can't find him. And after that, he drives from Alabama all the way to Bridgeville, Pennsylvania, and robs another bank. Mm -hmm. Then he drives back to Arkansas, and <laughs> he robs another convenience store. He takes another hostage. This is 30-year-old Bobby Jean Robertson. Yeah. And he netted about $163 from that robbery, killed Bobby Jean, and then took off to Colorado. So in Colorado, kind of northern Colorado, in uh -huh. a pretty sleepy area of the state, he robs two 7-Elevens pretty close to each other, yeah. and he murders the, clo the clerks at both stores. So that's James Balderson and Anthony Tate. They're Damn. both just college students yeah. in their early 20s. They were doing um, graveyard shifts at these convenience stores at yeah. these 7-Elevens. And the combined total for the two 7-Eleven robberies was yeah. $58. And what about all the banks and stuff earlier? Was he making a lot of money? He made some money. I think the one number that I saw, I think the first bank was $7,000. Mm -hmm. I think he's been making some money, but at the point at which he started killing people, yeah. like those robberies, he was netting nothing. You know? Yeah. It was just... About killing people. I mean, I think he just didn't give a fuck. He was just violent and insane. Yeah. You know, I mm -hmm. don't know if it was about killing people. It was just about... <laughs> Uh, going yeah. on this rampage. Right, I get it, yeah. So 17 hours later, he was finally stopped for speeding in Texas. <laughs> Again, with the traffic tickets. <laughs> like, they weren't. They didn't pull him over because they knew what his license plate number was. Right. He was just speeding, so they pulled him over, figured out who he was, and they take him into custody. At this point... Pearson slash Pruitt. We're just going to call him Pruitt. He yeah. had killed five people and committed eight robberies in the span of five months. Damn. And he says he wasn't to blame for all the killings because his $2,000 a week cocaine habit had turned him into a <laughs> mad dog killer. So he tried really hard to make mad, mad dog killer stick. That's like what he called himself. Oh, in no. Interviews. So he's trying to give himself a nickname for something that he also says he shouldn't be blamed for. Right. Exactly. He's just a, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Damn, man. Yeah. That is so sad. All those poor people. Just completely innocent bystanders. Wrong place. Wrong time. Getting hit by the freight train of this psychotic, like ego tripping fame hound. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. So upon his capture, uh -huh. Pruitt drops a bombshell. Okay. Uh huh. About so, his wife? This actually goes all the way back to the beginning of the story. All right. So when Pruitt testified against Benton, Alan Benton, yeah. for the murder of Zambito. Yeah, the jailhouse stabbing. Right, exactly. There actually was another witness that the defense brought up and... That witness was the prison priest. And the prison priest said he had seen Benton in the kitchen mm -hmm. helping other inmates prepare breakfast for like the whole prison. For the, for the yeah. prison. And he says, I saw him. I'm an eyewitness. He couldn't have been in uh, Zambito's cell in the early morning hours stabbing him because I saw him at that time. Wow. And they just didn't believe the priest. 
they basically, you know, they had this conflicting testimony mm -hmm. and they had Pruitt's testimony as being the star witness, plus mm -hmm. a couple other inmates who said that they saw something similar. Okay. And they ended up convicting him of conspiracy to commit murder, which apparently still has the same sentence. So he got life for conspiracy to commit murder. Okay. But that's kind of how that case wrapped up. Mm -hmm. And what Pruitt says after his capture is he's quoted in the Denver Post saying, quote, I actually killed William Zambito. I framed an innocent man and I got rewarded for doing it. Hmm. Big Al Benton said he'd pay me to kill Zambito when he found out they'd put the snitch in my cell. I took my shank and I started stabbing him in the morning while he was sleeping. He stuck his hand up to block the blows. I cut his hand really bad. Then I stabbed him in the face three or four times. I hit him in his throat. He suddenly bolted up and he was gurgling and I spit on him and I said, die, you motherfucker. And then he fell back and stopped gurgling. So they printed that in the newspaper. <laughs> Jesus. The 70s were wild. Man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So this guy is really trying to create this narrative for himself that he's this cold-blooded killer. Right. But he actually did kill Zambito. He actually is a cold-blooded killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So Pruitt says... Benton actually decided to hire someone else after he had approached him to kill Zambito. Yeah. So he talked to Pruitt for a little bit, decided for whatever reason, I don't want to use Pruitt uh -huh. and was going to pay someone else to do it. Yeah. And so when Pruitt heard about that, he was like, all right, dude, well, why don't I kill Zambito and then just frame you for it <laughs> yeah. and get into witness protection program and get out of jail. Right. Right. Yes. He's gaming the system and now he's bragging about it to the newspapers about being like, I tricked all of you guys. Yeah. And he does it all the time. Yeah. There's, he was he did press conferences. He talked to newspapers like he really did. Yeah. Talk a lot in the public sphere about what happened. Yeah. So he's convicted of everything. Right? Yeah. He goes to trial. He's convicted of of all of the crimes he committed. There's kind of no gray zone. Uh -huh. I believe the only state that had the death penalty at the time yeah. was Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So he got life sentences for his wife and everyone else that he killed in Colorado and, uh, you know, around the country. Yeah. But for the murder of Bobby Jean Robertson in Arkansas, he actually did get the death penalty for that one murder. Wow. Yeah. So he spent 17 years on death row in Arkansas, mm -hmm. where he became a born again Christian. <laughs> okay. And Once I, he got that cocaine out of his system. Right. He, he was like, whoo. He took a deep breath. He said, ah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I realize I found Jesus. Yeah. So I found this quote from him. This is uh -huh. like pretty close to when he was executed. Uh -huh. This is a quote from the Colorado newspaper. So on his relationship with Jesus. Quote, people say, if you got the Lord in your heart, you can't hate, but that's not what the Bible says. None of us is perfect. None of us is righteous next to the Lord. Man don't know what he's going to do five minutes from now. If there were a gun lying here and you reached up and smacked me, I might pick it up and blow your head off. I hope and pray to God I wouldn't, but you don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm getting it. I love that. That philosophy is just so like, uh, like a pretzel. You know what I mean? <laughs> it just folds in on itself. Well, he's basically saying like, no one's perfect. Therefore, you can't get mad at me for killing a bunch of people. And I could say I'm not going to kill more people. But let's face it. No one is perfect. So I might just do knows, that. Right. And no one knows. No one can tell the and future. you're not righteous. You don't get to claim that you're better than me because you think you won't kill someone. Because you don't know. And I don't know. I'll probably kill you. But that's just how it goes. Nikki, that's a pretty good sort of like interpretation of that quote. <laughs> well, I'm really into the story. I'm very smart. Yeah. It's pretty, I would, I read that and I was just like, that's so, of course this guy is just. Well, he wants it both ways, right? He wants all of the fame and notoriety. He wants to be a celebrity criminal murderer. He also doesn't want you to be mad at him about it but he does want you to be scared that he'll do it again right and at the end of this journey mm -hmm. ultimately Pruitt 
was killed by lethal injection in Arkansas in April 1999. Yeah. And his last meal consisted of a stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut, four Burger King Whoppers, French fries, fried eggplant, fried squash, fried okra, three two-liter bottles of Pepsi, a bucket of ice, and a whole pecan pie. <laughs> and he wanted a roasted duck, but he didn't think the prison would cook it correctly. <laughs> He's like, the last thing I want is a botched duck. And you know what? I totally, that's the only thing about him I relate to. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's like, because I know what I'm getting from Pizza Hut right. and the Whoppers and all that. Like, that is guaranteed to be good. You guys probably aren't going to mess up the pecan pie. But if you fuck up my duck, I will die an unhappy man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, uh, whoppers are so gross. Okay, back to the story. Yeah, well, I'm gonna finish the story. Okay, good, good. Quit good. talking about the dinner. <laughs> Another piece of the story, just to end it, mm -hmm. was that everyone was super pissed at Witness Protection Program for what happened. Right? Oh, there was a huge right. controversy around this particular case uh -huh. involving Geraldo Rivera, of all people. <laughs> yeah, he, he used to get involved in things back in the day. Yeah, yeah. and he was super anti-witness protection program, but maybe not because of a lot of um, like smart things. <laughs> <laughs> but he was definitely like an uh -huh. advocate. And uh -huh. he actually had an episode of his show yeah. dedicated to this whole thing. Yeah. So he had... Uh, an interview, like a taped interview with Pruitt that he oh. played on the same episode that he got all of the victim's families to come on the show. Mm -hmm. And Pruitt, of course, because Pruitt is a giant, you know... Jackass. Dillweed. He says, obviously these crimes would have never happened if I had, hadn't been released. Like, mm -hmm. that the federal government takes as much blame for this as I do. Right. Oh. So that's Pruitt's stance. And it's, then Geraldo mm -hmm. plays that against these really emotionally charged statements from the victim's family. Yeah. You know, and Geraldo tried to get Gerald Schur, who was the founder of the Witness Protection mm -hmm. Program, onto his show yeah. to talk about it. And Gerald Schur, of course, is like, He's had run-ins with Geraldo Rivera. Mm -hmm. Geraldo Rivera's tried to force him into interviews. He's yeah. trying to threaten them into interviews. Yeah. And they basically just said, no, we're not doing it. Yeah. Uh, but what he ended up doing was taking a response that Gerald Schur had made to something completely different out of context. Uh, At one point, he was talking about how the federal government had paid off some debts of people in the witness protection program. Mm -hmm. And... You know, he was being sort of grilled about that, saying, yeah. like, you know, the federal government is giving these criminals a gift. Right. right? They're bailing out criminals with taxpayer money. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of, you know, in so many words saying, well, you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. Yeah. And he played that response. <laughs> Oh, as his response to like these crying victims, family members. Yeah, yeah. So it was like caused all this outrage and, you know, it was this horrible thing. Yeah. And they ended up getting into this lawsuit battle. It was like this really dramatic thing. But yeah, I found this quote years later when asked about the incident. Mm -hmm. Geraldo Rivera was quoted as saying, quote, I have no clear recollection of the gory details of what happened in the sure controversy other than to suggest that he sounds from this account like a crybaby who could dish it out but not take it. <laughs> As to his charge of sleazy, what was really sleazy was the way promises made to program participants were allegedly not honored. <laughs> so whatever. What? So now he's saying the real problem was that the people in witness protection that I was trying to get rid of were mistreated? He's just a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. He's like, I don't really remember that. But now that you mention it, I'm pretty sure that guy sucks and I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah. I just thought that was, this, it's a crazy footnote to just be like, yeah. and also this spurred Geraldo Rivera into this like insane <laughs> tailspin. Right. Um, there was, you know, a few things like, I don't know if you have these questions lingering, mm -hmm. but I did because it did seem like the FBI and the witness protection program had messed up a bunch. Yeah. But in their defense, if we go all the way back to Ferreira, Sheriff Ferreira in mm -hmm. Albuquerque, when he sent off the fingerprints to the FBI to yeah. get 
like some information yeah, back. Yeah, to ID this person. Right. He had actually sent super smudged fingerprints. Mm-hmm. And he sent them via snail mail, like just through the normal postal service. Mm-hmm. So the FBI was like, we would never have gotten them in three days and processed them. Yeah, right. And they didn't, nothing showed up because apparently the fingerprints were smudged. I mean, it's the FBI. So a piece of me is like, yeah, they were smudged. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but that's what, that's what they say is like, they right. kind of got thrown under the bus for this thing. And then the other thing that's also true yeah. is that, Pruitt only had 11 months left in his sentence when he was pardoned. Mm-hmm. So it's not like Pruitt... He would have gone on a rampage eventually anyway. I mean, it's not like it would have been this angel for the rest of his life. I mean, you know, who knows? You go back in time in a time machine, you step on a butterfly, and then, like, everybody with long hair dies. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, you never know. <laughs> you never know, like, the ripple of what happens. But basically, they were just like, you can't just say... It's not like we released this guy who should have been in prison for life. He yeah. was serving 11 months left on a bank robbery sentence. And, right. You know, so the it characterization just, of it being... Like, like all the witness protection programs fall is kind of odd. It's an absurd maze of everyone pointing the finger at someone else. Yeah. Right. And then it's their fault. It's, it's the witness protections fault. It's whatever it's Albuquerque, you know, rinky dink police station gave us smudged fingerprints. And then, Pruitt himself is like, it's cocaine's fault. Actually, it's the government's fault for giving me this chance at all. It's like, even within his religious, I don't know, ideology or whatever way he's twisting his Christianity to save his own skin, he's sort of blaming God for the nature of how unreliable and violent men can be for no reason at any given moment. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I guess you're true. It's true. It is a, such an odd story because it's just such a blatant crime. It just is kind of like, how are you all blaming? Like, it's that guy. Yeah, that guy did that. <laughs> he did all of that. I mean, this story is full of violent crazies. So, like, whatever happened to Benton? Well, Benton served the sentence. They never reopened the murder case because basically what they said was that uh-huh. Benton did try and pay Pruitt uh-huh. to kill Zambito. So right. he did have a conspiracy to commit murder. I don't know how that equals a life sentence, but apparently it did. <laughs> so he so he was never let off the hook or his sentencing didn't change at all. No, no, no. But he did mm-hmm. become a notable white supremacist. <laughs> I guess. And also yeah. later ended up leaving the white supremacist like organization, the Aryan Brotherhood, uh-huh. uh, to snitch on everyone. <laughs> oh my God. Like much uh, later. Yeah, it's just like a musical chairs of like drug dealer, murderer, white supremacist, then you're a snitch again, then you find Christianity, then you're in witness protection. It's just like these people. Are I mean, like, I think the thread in general is just snitching. Right. Like, you know who else was a snitch? Uh-huh. A crazy snitch was if we go all the way back to the beginning of uh-huh. this story, John Piazza. Right. Right. So John Piazza was above Benton. I believe you described him as a Miami playboy. Well, he was super mobbed up too. Uh And when all of this stuff went down, John Piazza actually, you know, he got in trouble because of Zambito's testimony. Right. Right. Yes. So when that went down, he thought, well, I think I'm going to snitch too because I want to go to witness protection. (laughs) So he snitched on this higher up in the Florida Colombo family Uh on a guy named Thomas Farisi. So he got uh, immunity from snitching on Thomas Farisi who got 30 years. You know, it just went up the ladder like that. John Piazza went into witness protection Mm -hmm. after that. They renamed him John Petrocelli. Mm -hmm. And then this is actually just kind of, a crazy little addendum. Uh-huh. Also, I just want to be like super clear. Mm-hmm. I am not a journalist. <laughs> so take all of this with a grain of salt. I mean, I read a lot of court documents and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you but put like, a lot of work into trying to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Who are we I'm kidding? not making anything up, but yeah. there is a chance that I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, all right. Right? I'm, yeah. I'm doing my best. So yes. I think this is what went down. Mm-hmm. So John Petroselli gets to go into his new life, right? Mm -hmm. And then, like, later, PBS did a documentary series about the NFL in the 80s called 
an unauthorized history of the NFL. Uh And it was all about how the mob had fixed all of these games. Oh, cool. And they had fixed 12 games in the NFL season in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh Right. And they had a guy come on that program and say, I was there and I fixed, I helped fix these games. I'm a bookie. And it was John Petrus. It was our Miami playboy. <laughs> and so he would, I guess the, the documentary, I think got panned for being sort of like, ultimately being not well reported uh uh-huh, like some oh that's funny pbs getting uh, labeled sensationalist kind of uh-huh. but basically what ended up happening was he testified and then blew his cover <laughs> yeah <laughs> and ended up going back to jail on weapons charges for seven years after that oh damn <laughs> <laughs> they were just like he's got this reputation this is my white whale in this case uh-huh john piazza legendarily uh-huh. sung like a canary uh-huh. when he testified against Thomas Ferrisi. Yeah. So apparently in that trial, after, you know, uh, Zambito flipped on him and he flipped on Ferrisi, yeah. his testimony was insane. He admitted to all of these crimes and he told them all of these details. Yeah. But it's referenced so many times when I can't find the court transcript anywhere. Interesting. So I wasn't I mean, I'm sure it's out there. <laughs> this is not about it being buried. It's yeah. just about be, me not having the capability. It might be this. buried. If he was snitching on all types of things that he didn't need to be telling, it might have like shown up as like weird false evidence in other cases or I, something. I mean he I'm just so sad that I can't find the time he was the king snitch. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> as bad as we feel like, oh, Zambito flipped and like snitched on these yeah, guys. Right. One of them was a big white supremacist. Yeah, right. And the other one was the king of all snitches. <laughs> they so, all deserve each they other. They all deserve each other. Yeah. So I do have one question for you. And I know you're saying you're not a researcher. No, I am not a researcher. I know, I know. But <laughs> you were saying it's really hard to find anything about the early years of Pruitt's life. I don't know if it was because of... Things just not being digitized. Mm-hmm. I mean, the internet wasn't around, so maybe yeah. there just weren't records. But it's interesting. It just seems like nobody was curious about it. But I I, I read, like, a couple things about uh-huh. how, like I said, there was a runaway school bus, and he jumped on the school bus and saved the break. But yeah. the thing I couldn't even find was the actual first crimes that he committed yeah. or his court records. I just – I think – Part of this is probably because I don't know how to do this. If you're listening and you have any tips on how to <laughs> find things, tell me because I'd love to hear it. Yeah. But uh, so part of it might just be my capabilities, the limit of my capability. Yeah, but I just feel like for any notorious killer, you know, that was so high profile and so like in the public's eye, someone would have wrote a book and dug it up. It feels like that should be relatively simple, Googleable stuff. I know. And nobody did write a book. I read one book, uh-huh. the book that I referenced for this case for the most part. It's uh-huh. called Witsec Inside the Federal Witness Protection Program. Mm-hmm. And they had a it's, it's an awesome book about the whole sort of birth of the witness protection program. Mm-hmm. And that's by Gerald Schur, who mm-hmm. was the person who founded it and mm-hmm. he co wrote the book. So Pruitt's in that book. Uh-huh. And he seemed to be a really significant case for the federal government at the time, at the birth of the Witness Protection Program. Yeah. But other than that, I couldn't find a single other book or there's not even, you know, one of the crime shows that Uh has like episodes dedicated to each criminal. There's kind of nothing on him. There's a little bit on YouTube, but Uh pretty much there's just really very little information. And a piece of me just thinks that people just don't, care like there just hadn't been an interest but yeah what's weird about it to me is that it was a really really big national case i yeah. mean you, he hit you know what seven different states right i mean it was national news and the fallout was also super publicized because yeah. it brought to light the witness protection program and like set of questions surrounding that there were all of these senators who wanted to go after the witness protection program yeah. and you know people were had their doubts about it yeah. i mean there was a lot of controversy around the program especially in the beginning and pruitt's case really was at the center of a lot of that controversy right and there's just nothing about him and he's a wild man like i think he was a part of a bunch of biker gangs i think he was 
doing all kinds of crazy shit really young. He's got yeah. a long rap sheet, you know? Yeah. I mean, he's a one-eyed bank robber who killed a bunch of people. It seems like they would have made a movie about him already. I know, but there's kind of nothing. And you can't, you don't even know, did he have any kids? Uh-huh. You know, like, who's his sister? You know, nothing about his parents. You yeah. can't really find, I couldn't find anything. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find anything about his wife, R.I.P.? No. I couldn't find anything about her. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it just has to do with information not being available. I think part of it has to do with the fact that you just found a really cool case. It's kind of under represented in the zeitgeist and you brought your flavor to it oh you're so sweet <laughs> uh okay i have a weird theory yeah everyone's pointing fingers everyone's blaming everyone else everyone is trying to get off everyone's trying to you know make sure their name is remembered in history uh -huh, right? uh -huh. this is what i blame for this whole thing this what? is my completely concocted stupid theory <laughs> i think that when he was a kid and he fell down that flight of stairs and the Coke bottle went into his eye and he lost his eye. I think it rewired his brain and drove him crazy. And that was the first butterfly ripple effect of all of the chaos that followed. You know, I think that's as good a theory as any. So <laughs> how do you feel about true crime, Nikki? I want to know. Well, today this was a really crazy story. And I'm conflicted because that's the kind of story that I'm really into, but all these innocent people died. Right. And like you're into it with pop culture and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, I love yeah. those kind of films and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, so I don't know. I'm just really conflicted. I mean, I'm, I've got a cold sweat going on. You know what I mean? Like feel my hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to Muriel's Murders. As always, Muriel did all the research, and I did all the sound engineering and post-production. To help support the podcast and to unlock exclusive episodes, please sign up for our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Muriel's Murders. You can also find us at Muriel's Murders on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. And the reason to do that is because we work on little accompanying animations for each one of these episodes, and uh, we love love them and we'd love for you to check us out yeah they're pretty pretty wild dude they're great animations a lot of them are from nick's brain which you will not understand <laughs> until you experience and yes our dms are open plus you can email us at muriel's at gmail.com please rate and review muriel's murders on apple Podcasts. it really does help us grow and thank you to everyone who has taken the time to leave a review thus far, literally, it boosts my ego 10 times. <laughs> we are, we I are love it. Very sensitive artists. Yeah. And our hearts do swell uh, based on your guys' kind words. So do our heads. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, our music is by Mario Castellini. Find him on Instagram at Castellini Beats. Thank you to Ryan and Ryan at Campfire Media. And if you want more of Muriel and I, check out our non murder podcast. It's called Hella in Your 30s. It comes out every Monday. Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. That's it. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.